All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to today's uh, edition of the, the Polypody webinar. Uh, today, we have two great speakers uh, speaking much more on the on the systematic side of, of uh, polyploid uh, biology and their role in evolution. Uh, up first this morning is uh, Dr. Ovidu uh, uh, Paun, uh, who is a associate professor at the University of Vienna uh, and a group leader at Plant Ecological Genomics. Uh, he received his uh, 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 PhD at uh, the University of Vienna, working with uh, Elvira Horandel and, and Todd Stussi on the evolution of apomixis in the Ranunculus casobiscus biscus group, uh, and has been uh, at the University of Vienna for uh, uh, quite a few years, starting uh, as a group leader in 2010, uh, as a, in 2015 as an assistant professor and an associate professor uh, starting last year. Uh, his group works on uh, understanding why and how organisms diversify, and they focus on the adaptation and divergence uh, uh, in allopolyploid uh, species complexes. And this morning, uh, is going to tell us about the macro and micro evolutionary drivers of allopolyploid evolution in Dactyla rhiza uh, and the Orchidaceae. Uh, and with that, I'm going to let Ovidu take it away for, for us. Thank you, Mike. Thank you again also for the invitation um, and the orga organizing such a nice uh, series. So um, just to provide the context of my uh, presentation, I will start by stating that, um, of course, as we all know, polyploids tend to uh, originate recurrently. Um, and um, these recurrent origins may have um, two implications. They may enrich the gene pool uh, of the genetic pool of um, the respective uh, polyploid lineages. And also, they may uh, increase species diversity at the polyploid level. However, um, it is not yet completely understood uh, what are the drivers and the implications of uh, potential ecological partitioning of uh, such sibling allopolyploid lineages. And um, also, we can use the such natural sibling allopolyploids to um, investigate genomic responses um, after whole genome doubling. Um, for example, um, testing or, or uh, questioning what is the uh, adaptive and what is the stochastic portion of these genomic responses. And I will directly dive in Dactyloriza um, here, uh, starting by uh, showing you a species tree um, of the diploids, uh, diploid lineages in, in the genus. So there are 10 diploid species uh, plus a species which is missing here because um, we, did, we had just a single sample of this uh, Eastern Asian Aristata, which um, um, so one species is not enough to uh, test species delimitations or to uh, include in a species tree. Um, but so roughly we have 11 uh, species, I would say, um, which, um, um, and, and, and here you can see that there are two um, major groups, the gray group, uh, Fuxi, Sakifera, uh, Clade, and um, uh, light gray um, uh, here, uh, the incarnata um, euxina uh, clade. These two clades uh, actually formed uh, several times polyploids, so they hybridized to form several times polyploids. Um, and um, these two clades diverged um, roughly six million years ago, as you see here in this um, with this purple arrow. Um, and um, so, um, to, uh, so they diverged in allopatry with the uh, dark gray lineage being uh, a, a main European lineage, whereas the um, light gray uh, clade being an um, Asian um, um, lineage. However, um, after, so Euxina and Dombrosa are just uh, Asian, um, whereas Incarnata has returned to Europe um, roughly 1.5 to 2 million years ago. Uh, and actually, Incarnata is the paternal lineage of uh, most polyploids in the genus. The maternal lineage is always from the dark gray uh, clade, um, most likely um, due to a nuclear cytoplasmic incompatibility, which is consistent, uh, a consistent process in this, um, in this genus. So let's have a look at the amount of polyploids. Uh, you can see here uh, different um, sampling localities, which we used in our in a recent paper we published, um, and this follows roughly the distribution range of each polyploid lineage. Um, we can uh, see here that there are much more polyploid lineages than actually diploid lineages in the in in this genus. 
Um, and um, also we can observe that um, if the polyploids have at least one parent which uh, tends to be regional, they also tend to remain regional. Uh, here in Bacteriosa, there is really an atypical um, example uh, because um, polyploids in the genus do not have, so in general, do not have larger distribution ranges than the diploids, which is really atypical, uh, right, for polyploids. Now, um, most of these polyploids, actually, with one exception, these polyploids, um, their origin was associated with the whole genome doubling event, except uh, Dr. Isa Bernensis, which is, um, had the homoploid um, uh, origin between, so resulting from hybridization between um, at least two different polyploids. Um, we also observe uh, that there is a frequent gene flow between the tetraploids, but also between the tetraploids and the diploids, as you will see a little bit in a couple of slides later, um, as this um, species, um, so this genus, uh, together with its related genera, these are orchids, so they don't have an endosperm, therefore uh, there is no impairment to endosperm formation in a triploid bridge. Um, so these orchid seeds will, um, or, or these orchid uh, plants will be, uh, will have a mycorrhizal association and they will be partial microheterotrophic in the early stages of their life, uh, depending on fungi. So therefore they don't need this endosperm. Now I will dive in more into this orange um, a group of polyploids formed by Foxia and Incarnata. Uh, so um, these are sibling allopolyploids um, and their parents, Dactylariza Foxi is always acting as the maternal parent uh, and Dactylariza Incarnata always as the paternal parent. Um, the two uh, diploids have differences in their genomes. Uh, Dactylariza Incarnata, if you remember, I mentioned before, returned to Europe roughly 1.5 million years ago. Um, and we think that this was associated with a strong bottleneck, decreasing significantly its heterozygosity compared to Fuxi, but also increasing the amount of transposable elements. Um, so uh, roughly incre increasing genome size by 20%. Um, and this is happening even uh, today. So we observe that today that uh, uh, Dr. and Kanata has more transposable elements, but also more active transposable elements and in general, a, a, a lower um, heterochromatic sRNA uh, lens um, control of transposable elements. Now you see that um, there is here a time arrow uh, indicating age, how we infer this age. We did this by comparing, uh, so based on rat sequencing data, uh, using a ploidy aware um, genotyping uh, approach based on GATK and um, empirical Bayesian genotyping of by Lixnitsin polyploids, a program developed by Paul Blishak. Um, so based on this data, we compare the relatedness of um, each polyploid to one of the parents and the other parent. And you can see here how this relatedness uh, uh, decreases. Um, and we hypothesize this decrease uh, follows a, a timeline. We also uh, looked at uh, private alleles of each polyploid against its siblings. And here, we, again, we hypothesize that um, uh, an older polyploid will have more private alleles because it, it would have more time to accumulate um, its own SNPs. And all this analysis, so comparing to one parent to the other parent and compared to its sibling lineages uh, provided consistent results um, across. Now, we can use such series of polyploids with different age um, by, as, as replicates to understand how um, different pro processes progress in time. For example, genome evolution. Uh, and this is data from, uh, which is analyzed by one of uh, the PhD students in my group, Mimi Erickson. Um, so she's looking at the genome scheming and she's trying to quantify uh, for example, a uh, number of total repeats. And we see here that at the diploid um, part, that incarnata, the one which has higher uh, genomes, so larger genome, of course, it will have also a larger proportion of uh, repeats. In the polyploids, so they are arranged according to our hypothesized age, Miley's being older and Pulperella being younger. <clears throat> and we observe that uh, they start off with roughly additive uh, size or, or proportion of repeats. And then they increase um, 
perhaps going up and then slight, slightly coming down. Um, and although the, if you look here on the y-axis, this the magnitude here is like 4%. Uh, however, 4% of the seven gigabases genomes, uh, this is a one C value, um, results in a approximate magnitude of change here of um, um, larger than the one time Arabidopsis genome, right? Um, however, when we look at what causes this increase in total number of repeats, uh, by comparing, for example, frequent elements like such as copia or gypsy, we observe that actually this is not due to increasing in such in the activity of such elements. Actually, if anything, gypsy and copia uh, decrease uh, in time. However, we uh, Mimi has found um, <clears throat> that a um, miniature inverted repeat transposable element, the so-called mite, which is a group of non-autonomous class two transposable elements. Uh, is causing this increase in genome size um, departing from additivity. And if we look closer into this uh, element, we observe so these are the diploids, this is the maternal parent, the one which is a smaller genome, and this is the paternal parent with a larger genome. <clears throat> we observe that actually this element is more um, frequent in the maternal uh, genome. And here this is an outgroup, so we can assume that uh, this element recently expanded in the maternal smaller genome, um, and this happened previous to the whole genome duplication events already. We can also look into how, <coughs> hetero, um, how, how polymorphic is this um, uh, element in each lineage, in the diploids, but also in the polyploids, and we observe that this element is actually highly polymorphic within each polyploid lineage, so probably it has um, still ongoing dynamics, um, and this appears to be a major, major driver of genome size um, increase after our polyplization in this group. Uh, <clears throat> we can observe here the, how the genome size varies with the uh, age. So again, purple is the younger polyploid fitting uh, additivity. Um, and um, as we go on, the polyploids seem, seem to increase slightly and then stabilize around seven gigabases. So let's go back to the this question of ecological relevance of recurrent whole genome duplication, right? Because we have here several polyploids um, and we can investigate, for example, patterns of gene flow and try to infer um, if they will collapse into the same species with time or if they are still, if they will maintain independence. Um, so um, one of my master students, Anna Sophie Haronek, uh, she's working with, uh, again, with rod sequencing data across um, a pretty large uh, sample um, of three polyploids, um, myalis, transgenia, purpurella. <clears throat> so purpurella is one of the youngest polyploids, myalis is, is the oldest in the series, and transgenia is kind of middle age. Uh, and um, she, by using EBG with a um, allo -slip, slip mode, um, she could separate the genomes, the subgenomes of the polyploids, of each polyploid, um, based on uh, reference um, frequencies of alleles in the two diploid parents. And then um, we also uh, tested um, in silico the accuracy of um, the uh, separating the genomes, the subgenomes, and um, you know this is pretty high accuracy uh, over, uh, so roughly 85% accuracy. Um, and in the results, we observe a consistent geographic structure of genetic variation in which, for example, Tronstein, in particular Tronstein, which has a more disjunct distribution uh, in Europe, um, following previously glaciated areas, so Britain, Northern, so Scandinavia, and also the Alps in particular. Um, so in particular, this lineage has this uh, geographic structure of genetic variation, um, which is which is actually uh, making us uh, wonder if these are multiple origins within transgenery or maybe in isolation by distance due to you know, barriers to gene flow such as um, um, uh, you know, masses of uh, water between Britain and, and the rest of the continent. Um, in addition, we observe an asymmetrical gene flow between uh, myalis and transgenery, but also between propella and transgenery, for example, here. Uh, which makes us wonder, especially this happens in sympatry. So here in Austria, the two species, Myris and Transtania, are sympatric. And here in, in Scotland, um, Transtania and Propella are sympatric. And um, 
which makes us wonder um, if um, there is some strong divergence selection at some loci, which are related to morphological and ecological um, distinctiveness of the uh, polyplates, because these polyplates are still recognizable and have their own um, ecologies, as, we, as you will see in a second, in, uh, even when they um, share a lot of genes uh, due to gene flow. So to test if uh, this was, uh, so this structure in Transteni was due to um, multiple origins or isolation by distance. We did, um, we used IBC modeling on this route sequencing data. So however, these are preliminary results um, because they uh, are based on some previous um, <coughs> separation of the two uh, subgenomes. So we will repeat this analysis maybe with the uh, other um, more complex tools. So um, we did this on each subgenome separately and the signals from each subgenome is highly consistent, basically indicating that uh, this is just a summary of the results, indicating that uh, each polyploid myelis and John Steiner, for example, had an independent origin and confirming our um, hypothesis, previous hypothesis. So myelis, it's an older polyploid, um, roughly 2000 generations old and uh, John Steiner, it's a slightly younger polyploid um, roughly a thousand generations old. So provided um, provided this, this uh, high gene flow, which I showed on the previous slide, the question is how are these maintaining the evolutionary independence? And we should look a little bit in the ecological preference of this uh, polyploid. So myelis um, prefers um, just meadows, um, which can go on the, um, so messy to, towards dry meadows. Um, while Stranstani really prefers wet meadows, you can see here uh, water close to a Stranstani site. It's not rivers, it's just under, uh, an influx of underground water, um, a continuous influx of underground water in these um, habitats. In addition, apart from water uh, availability, we observe actually that the two polyploids uh, have very um, significantly different um, uh, preference for soil chemistry. Uh, so here you see uh, data from um, myelis in green and from Tramstani in purple. And in per so in general, Tramstani prefers um, sites where you have very low um, levels of uh, macro and micronutrients. Um, in particular, uh, nitrate is very um, different here um, with uh, Tramstani appearing to be a, in a way ex an extremophile with zero available nitrate in most of its sites across Europe. Um, and actually, you can see here that Tronstani grows often in, uh, associated with Drosera, uh, which is a carnivorous plant. Uh, and of course, uh, such carnivorous plants will grow in uh, very nitrate poor environments because they get their nitrate from, from insects. We also asked the question if this um, um, difference in soil chemistry is reflecting a difference in, um, in uh, distinct leaf chemistry. Um, because sometimes uh, this can, you know, they, they could, it could be that they accumulate nitrate, for example, in the, in the leaves and reuse it rather than gaining it again from the, from the soil, or maybe they get the nitrate from their um, fungi, right? So we um, test it and we observe still a difference in the leaf, leaf chemistry in, nit in nitrogen, in uh, phosphorus, but also in carbon. Um, with Tramstani again here in purple having lower levels of this uh, element. However, when you look at um, carbon to nitrogen and carbon to phosphate uh, ratios, you observe that, um, that Dactyloreza Tramstani seems to be adapted to these very poor environments because its ratio, despite the low level of um, resources, its ratio of uh, product production, product producing carbon, it's much higher than in Mayalis, right? So this, this um, hints towards uh, local adaptation into these poor environments. So we tested um, based on rna seq data in a common garden to see what are the main geocategories which are different between the two polyploids. And um, this is a fairly complex graph, but uh, the color here um, uh, shows the um, um, direction of um, where genes will be more expressed or highly expressed and what, where genes will be lowly expressed. So uh, blue is high, highly high expression in transteinary, so in this extremophile um, with nitrate, and I think it's um, it's uh, when you have uh, the genes more highly expressed in myalis, um, and 
yeah, there are several geotherms, but I, we, we mark them um, with green arrows, for example, if they are related to photosynthesis, with um, red arrows if they are related to abiotic stress and so on. I mean, what you can see here is that, um, in particular, Traunstein, this extremophile seems to upregulate its photosynthesis. Um, and um, we, pl we plotted these geo geotherms at the level of um, the photosystem. And you can see here, so these differential express genes, which are upregulated in Traunstein, compared to the other polyploid, are shown in, in red. Um, and you can see that particular uh, blocks of these photosystems are uh, upregulated in, in their entire, in, 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 um, so all components of these blocks are upregulated, such as the light harvesting proteins, all six light harvesting proteins, then this oxygen evolving complex, and so on and so forth. So there are particular blocks which are affected by this upregulation. We also measure photosynthesis, um, and to cut the story short, um, what we think that it happens is that um, there is a strong correlation between nitrate in the soil and the um, uh, presence of uh, uh, chlorophyll, which we measure that it's lower in Traunstein. So chlorophyll sits here as a magnifying glass to the photosystem. Um, and because there is no nitrate in the soil, they have less chlorophyll, so they, they don't have this magnifying glass. So therefore, they upregulate the um, light harvesting proteins, uh, getting more electrons, uh, linear electron flow, for example getting more electrons through the photosystem, meaning that they also have to deal with uh, non photosynth with, with uh, dissipating this energy when the sun is too strong, right? Um, and so these are basically um, very large, um, um, so significant phenotypic uh, and physiological differences between the two plants, which allow them to adapt to their environments. I think I'm kind of out of time, so I will go directly to the Wait just a second, sorry. I'll go, oops. Um, I'll go directly to the conclusions. Sorry about that. Um, so um, we observe in this genus, in Bacteriorhiza, uh, a frequent gene flow between sibling allopolyploids. However, the sibling allopolyploids have distinct, maintain distinct measurable ecologies. Um, and adaptation to extreme nitrate poor environments in Traunsteinery. It's uh, happening due to uh, modifications at the level of transport, um, narrow leaves, light harvesting, and photoprotection. Um, so, large scale ecophysiological eco modifications, which are allowed by um, um, these whole genome duplication events. Um, this is part of what I did not show now, but I'll just mention very briefly. Uh, tra transcriptomic alterations, so these this changes after whole genome doubling affect ecologies as a result of parental dominance in the opposite directions. Um, then, um, yeah, I should have mentioned something about imbal compensatory imbalances. Um, but I showed you actually the, that uh, transposable elements from the smaller genome um, are driving genome size dynamics after whole genome duplication. So uh, with that, I have several um, people which contributed to this um, study. Um, and we, um, yeah, please look out for um, several papers coming up uh, from uh, this group. And thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you. That was, that was wonderful. Um, so we have plenty of time. We have, we have about five minutes or so for a few minutes here for, a talk, or for questions. So folks want to uh, go ahead and as usual, put the questions in the chat box uh, and then we can uh, turn the uh, uh, cameras on and, and, and microphones and ask those questions if you'd like. Sorry, I don't know if you if you saw the slides for the last couple of slides, because I think my sharing stopped. It, it did on the very last couple. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> no worry. I, I but we got we got most of it. I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's complicated with the. Um, I have also here several screens and. Um, So at least my last my slide is acknowledgement. <laughs> there you go. Well, 
Well, I have a real quick question. So it seems like the, uh, uh, well, here, Tony has a question real quick. Okay, I was gonna, I, I let everyone else ask first. So um, Tony, if you wanna turn on your, your camera and microphone, feel free to do that to ask your question. So actually, I'm interested in the bite. So before I ask the question, I want to say that it was a very clear, and very nice talk. So I enjoyed it a lot. And um, I'm actually, yes, interested in the mite that has caused the genome size increase. So because a mite is a very small, non-autonomous element, I'm wondering if there is an autonomous partner that uh, mobilizes this element, if you know that. So um, I, we are still doing investigations on this mite. Actually, we also want to um, to localize it on the genome to see if it's uh, interspersed or if it's you know um, localized to particular parts of the genome. Uh, and I I personally don't know if Mimi looked into um, this part. And I think Mimi is in the audience. Mimi, can you answer maybe? But I don't think I don't think Mimi is so far to know um, the answer to this question actually. So we are still working on this. Yes, so it would be very interesting to hear because we are also wondering if it's possible, because sometimes we see that um, non-autonomous elements are very active, but we don't really find a partner. So we are really wondering if that is possible to, yeah, to do that, to jump around without something that pushes it. So yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I, uh, this is a very interesting question and we have to follow it up. Maybe we will contact you at some point. All right, uh, Jeanette has a question. Go ahead and pop your video on there, Jeanette, if you'd like to, or your audio. Um. Hi, great stuff. Um, I'm just curious because uh, I'm, I, I know of a student here at, at UBC who's documenting a, um, a, a new case of carnivory uh, in an orchid that was previously unknown. And uh, I'm just uh, intrigued by, um, by this system and wondering if there's any hint of any possibility that there's supplementation happening uh, in any form. And I guess my shorthand for that is, is there anything sticky about this plant? Um, well, there is no carnivore in the, uh, you know, expected sense or traditional sense of catching insects. However, they, um, so both of them, we looked at, uh, because they have this mycorrhizal association and uh, with time when the roots are growing, actually they consume their fungi. Um, but the hyphae, I don't know if this is a significant contribution to their body mass or, or, or resources. Um, I think they gain more from the fungi while they are alive as when they are consumed actually, uh, okay. perhaps. Okay. Yeah, but no, there is no insect, uh, so carnivore and insects, there is nothing uh, related to that. Cool, thanks. You're welcome. Well, I'll ask a real quick question. Um, I, I found it really intriguing the amount of the, the, the differences that you're observing. Do you, do you how much of the, these sort of ecological changes do you think are being driven by um, sort of cytotype, uh, nucleotide kinds of effects of the changes in genome size and whatnot versus adaptive evolution following the, the polyploidy? Um, the, the polyplobization events themselves? Do you have a, a sense? I mean, it's, you have a sense of that, but I'm, I'm sort of curious because it does seem like a lot of these things are all kind of tangled up here um, in the system. Yeah, thank you. So, so both the species which I compared with, we compared with rna data have the same parents and um, have the same, so that hybridization happened in the same direction. So if, you know, um, there is the same cytoplasmic nuclear incompatibility or the same mechanism in both species, right? Um, however, one, so, this would hint rather for post whole genome duplication evolution. Adaptive evolution, yes. Um, 
definitely not that I don't think that a lot happened at the um, uh, sequence level, right? Because um, in 1000 generations, there is not much time to, to accumulate a lot of mutations, right? Mm -hmm. um, however, what I have actually not shown here is that we observe that uh, one, um, so dominance in alternative directions as uh, shaping these uh, differences in uh, gene expression. So this is uh, that one polyploid tends to follow one parent in the expression patterns, and the other poly polyploid tends to follow the other um, parent in uh, shaping most of its uh, expression patterns. Um, so yeah, so um, I think there is a, and, and the, we also looked at cross talk between cis and trans regulation. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I ran out of time, I could not show this. Um, basically, um, everything happens between, um, you know, due to such cis trans uh, regulatory um, balances or, or rearrangements, if I if I may say so, at the regulatory level, mm. in the two parental um, um, genomes. Right. Well, that, that's really fascinating. I, I look forward to reading those papers uh, when they when they come out. All right. Well, I think that with that, we'll wrap up. Um, uh, Ovidu's uh, talk time here. Uh, and if anybody has any other questions, uh, we'll again be able to circle back at the end of the both talks to, to answer those. So um, keep thinking about the uh, this, this really cool system uh, and save those questions for the end. Uh, all right. Well, I'd like to move on to our second speaker then um, uh, of today. Uh, and our second speaker is, is Dr. Dirk Albach. Uh, Dirk is a uh, professor uh, for biodiversity and evolution of plants and the director of the Botanical Garden. Uh, at the University of Oldenburg. Uh, Dirk received his uh, PhD uh, also at the University of Vienna uh, with uh, professors Fisher, Chase, and, and Krell Huber. Uh, and he is uh, currently the editor-in-chief of Taxon, the chair of the section of biodiversity and evolution in the German Pianco Society, uh, among other accomplishments and, and achievements. Um, and Dirk today is gonna tell us about his research on, um, oh, once again, there's a screen shared here. <laughs> <laughs> It'll let you share. All right. And uh, Dirk's going to tell us about his work on hybridization and polypolarization in Veronica spicata and relatives uh, at the continental scale using GBS. And with that, I'll let Dirk take it away. Thank you. All right. Can you see it? Good. Looks so good. I'm trying to compete with uh, the nice flowers Ovidu presented and uh, I'll present some uh, of uh, the nicest uh, looking uh, species of Veronica. Actually, I also talking about uh, the orchid Veronica as well today. So at least that, but um, our interest started with uh, the um, group because it's such a nice ecologically diverse group. It's about 30 species but it has amazing large ecological vari variation from uh, those that are in swampy areas, lake margins to those uh, with, which are actually closer to the desert. I'll show photos of that later. So despite this large variation, there are lots of um, intraspecific variation. And also we have seven species which show intraspecific variation in ploidy level with diploids and tetraploids occurring in uh, basically the same region. What we are mostly interested in is uh, what was the effect or the consequences of polyploidy um, in this group for the recolonization of uh, Eurasia after the ice ages. So as you can see here, the, this is distribution area of uh, the subgenus in uh, Eurasia. It's, partly because we are lacking here in uh, Japan and Korea, the exact distribution areas of the species there. But uh, as you can see, there are several species that are fairly widespread and across the Eurasian area where apparently in the Pleistocene ages, we had uh, large steppic areas. So I will tell you in three pieces uh, what we have learned about hybridization and polyploidy in this group based on uh, GBS data and some other data. First, I will summarize what we've learned about uh, the two species which occur widely 
in the uh, Eurasian area, Veronica Spicata and Veronica Langifolia. Then I will focus on the biodiversity hotspot for this group in the Altai Mountains and finish off with uh, some comments on a study done in southeastern Europe. So these are the two most widespread species, Veronica longifolia from swampy areas, almost uh, aquatic, to Veronica spicata, which grows uh, a lot in um, yeah, semi-dry grasslands uh, in uh, Eurasia. Rare in uh, Central Europe, but quite common in uh, further Eastern areas. So what we did first is we compared uh, the ecological niches of the diploids and the tetraploids. So this is um, Veronica longifolia. And um, here you can see that the ecological niches on this large scale broadly overlap with uh, apparently some uh, of the diploids occurring further north. But as you can see, there are also some tetraploids up here in Finland. So there is no real differentiation uh, in the um, diploid and tetraploid Veronica longifolia. Looks a bit different, uh, different in Veronica spicata because uh, the tetraploid Veronica spicata are restricted uh, to Europe and uh, west of the Ural Mountains, whereas uh, there is lot, quite a lot of diploids uh, in uh, Asia. But within Europe, again, quite some overlap. So we estimated uh, niche overlap. And as you can see here, there's broadly same ecological niche which matches our uh, observations in the field where they uh, broadly co-occur in uh, close areas. We did crossing experiments and you can see here, actually all the diploids, no matter whether it's longifolia or spicata, they can easily cross get seeds. Tetraploids, no matter which species, they can easily get uh, seeds. But ploidy is a strong, reproductive barriers in these uh, species. And this is actually also true for many other species in the subgenus. We have not only crossed these two species, but we have also started crossing other species. And basically, it's the same all over. So do we find these hybrids? We did GBS analysis, as I mentioned, across uh, Eurasia. And you can see here, yes, we do find hybrids popping up everywhere across Europe. Not a large frequency, but we find them quite frequently wherever they co-occur. And where diploids picata meets diploids longifolia and where tetraploids longifolia meets uh, tetraploids picata. And this is something rather typical for this is uh, in Ukraine where we found Veronica longifolia here along the uh, small lake. And uh, behind here, you can see the grassland where um, Veronica spicata occurs. So along these margins and environmental gradients, you can find uh, also the hybrids, but only within one ploidy. And what we found is that apparently there is uh, asymmetrical gene flow towards Veronica langifolia. So, what uh, do we find if the situation gets a bit more complex and we are, don't have uh, just one species or two species uh, growing next to each other, but uh, even more. So I, this is the Altai Mountains on the border of uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, China, and Mongolia. Very nice area. And you can see uh, here are enough lake and uh, river areas where we find, again, Veronica longifolia, but we can also find subalpine areas and even then going into Mongolia, these uh, semi desert like uh, habitats. And again, we find Veronica all along these uh, environmental gradients. So these are the species we find. Pinata, that's the one growing in semi desert species. We find five to six species there. And we find lots of intermediate uh, species or intermediate plants, which uh, have been described as hybrids. So initially, our 
together with our Russian colleagues, uh, we made the hypothesis on based on uh, morphology. So we had these six species, Spicata, Spuria, Incana, Longifolia, Pinata, and Porphyriana. And we have the described hybrids, seven overall. So we tested these hybrids using uh, GBS. And uh, first we measured ploidy. And as you can see, most of the uh, species in the Altai Mountains are diploid. Incana is tetraploid. Longifolia occurs there, as I mentioned before, as diploid and tetraploid. So what does GBS say? We did not really confirm the hybrid origin of uh, Taigishensis, uh, only confirmed one parent, but we are not clear here. And as you've seen before, this is Veronica Chemalensis, which was suggested to be the hybrid of Incana and Porphyriana, the diploid and the tetraploid. We did not confirm that. All of those plants identified as Chimalensis were indeed Grisia, which would then uh, confirm, to, conform to the hybrid of the tetraploid Incana and tetraploid Longifolia. So apparently it holds true that only same ploid uh, can form hybrids. But we did more. We did uh, demographic analysis to understand better what is going on as hybridization there. Doing, uh, demographic analysis with GFOX to analyze gene flow and doing Klein analysis using introgress. And to make things short, with uh, the analysis of gene flow, we found again asymmetrical gene flow. And um, especially from the local COM uh, species to the widespread more rare species. And we also found that uh, the divergence between the species was quite recent. I'll come back to that later. And using the Klein, anal Klein analysis, we found an axis of homozygotes, similar to what uh, Ovidus um, said, I guess, with most of the individuals being F2 or backcrossed individuals. So, Hybridization in the Altai, we have dubious recent divergence time using GBS. Um, actually, um, this stirred quite some discussion among us in the group whether we really know enough about the mutation rate in GBS uh, to do these analyses properly and whether we know enough about generation time. These species grow easily from seed to flower in two years in the greenhouse but uh, do we actually know how long they can survive in the wild? So maybe the generation time is longer. Maybe we need to adjust mutation rate uh, in such analyses. Then morphology, ecology, and even karyology. We did some GISH analyses together with colleagues uh, in uh, Brno, suggest that these hybrids are F1 hybrids. However, DNA suggests that those are almost exclusively F2 or back crosses, which actually is uh, then uh, implicating that maybe we are sequencing lo loci that are biased, or there, are, uh, there is some selection for uh, specific alleles of one parent. So I'm not really sure that uh, these kinds of analyses and these high polyploids really show the uh, real picture, and uh, we should look more into the evolution of uh, loci that we amplify using GBS. And then there is a question of uh, asymmetrical gene flow. And um, apparently it's always gene flow from the local parent adapted to the uh, Altai mountains towards the widespread parent, which would make sense uh, ecologically. But nevertheless, I mean, since we doubted some of the results based uh, on uh, GBS before, is this real or is this really uh, maybe some uh, selection in the genome due to then uh, sampling bias? So um, there's, uh, I guess, still some things uh, to analyze in uh, this uh, kind of data. But uh, what Reviewers and other systems uh, that uh, we published uh, already mentioned was um, the question whether it's appropriate to mix ploides in one analysis. And um, 
we did not really distinguish uh, diploids and tetraploids in these analyses. And um, so we questioned uh, also that. And uh, one of my master's students analyzed uh, this question in more detail in another group on the Balkan Peninsula. And this is uh, the area where you find um, Veronica spicata widespread across Europe. And then in this area here, the Pannonian Basin, um, Veronica orchidea, and another close related species. And uh, in this case, we were fortunate to be able to compare the same DNAs from an earlier AFLP study, roughly published uh, nine years ago, where we find quite a lot of hybrids uh, in the pa um, Balkan Peninsula. We analyzed, as I mentioned, partly uh, the same DNA and found that GBS better fitted to the morphology than AFLP. Plus, interestingly, those individuals that were inferred to be hybrids based on AFLP suddenly came out as uh, true to type uh, of the species which uh, they morphologically belong to. So this was kind of reaffirming, but uh, not uh, everybody has a chance. So if you do have some old samples, DNA samples, which you use for AFLP, maybe it's uh, the time to reanalyze the DNAs and see whether you get the same results. And exactly that is uh, what uh, Janis then uh, did and questioning what did we really analyze with AFLPs. So he did some simulation analysis and um, don't worry, I don't uh, get you through the whole uh, picture there, but he simulated uh, SNPs using the R package by Meyermans with two populations, 25B and tw uh, 25 tetraploid populations, 100 biallelic SNPs, different settings, different missing data uh, settings, so analyzing uh, the effect of missing data, but uh, that was not uh, that conclusive. But what he also did is uh, analyzing the way we code polyploids. So in a co-dominant fashion, you would uh, uh, code these uh, individuals like this. But actually what uh, iPirate and Stacks do is they diplodize the, the data. So you don't have actually the tetraploid uh, coding, but uh, you have the heterozygote uh, being an AB. And what AFLP did, they code them just as present absent. So what effect does that have? Just showing you the full data set with co-dominant iPirate and dominant coding. And you can see here the full circles are the um, tetraploids, the empty circles are the diploids, and the dominant uh, markers are sep uh, separating the polities uh, from each other. Whereas with uh, iPirate or co-dominant uh, markers, there is no separation among the um, diploid and tetraploid. So apparently diploidization of SNP data, like iPad does, does not really matter, at least in these simulations. But coding as dominant markers, such as an AFLP, really matters and uh, was likely not appropriate from us uh, to really mix the diploid and tetraploid Veronica's back uh, then in 2011. What uh, Janis also investigated is the effect of parallax. And um, there is a nice tool by Edgardo Ortiz uh, based on the method by McKinney who identifies parallax based on excuse me, the proportion of heterozygotes and the allelic ratio. Assuming that singletons have nearly one-to-one -one allelic ratio and a low number of or low proportion of heterozygotes. So this actually reduced the data set considerably, actually close to by half. But the, diff, the picture between the two results is basically the same. It's just, you look at them, it's flipped upside down. So the black and gray are here at the bottom, but up here on the top, and, um, but green is uh, right and red is left. 
there's only a few individuals like this which change position and uh, which uh, could influence the results. So based on uh, this comparison, we also did uh, structure analysis and in structure, basically the same. You may only see very, very small differences. So apparently, parallax don't matter, at least in our case. So uh, I have to admit that our case may be special for several reasons. First, it's two close related species and not just a large group of uh, divergent species. And uh, we have uh, autopolyploids and not allopolyploids. And this may also influence the results. We haven't tested this yet, but um, maybe that would be interesting to compare. So actually the take home messages of my talk, what does matter is, yes, hybridization increases phenotypic diversity, but actually the question is what is the long-term effect of uh, hybridization in the group? Do we really see, like we anticipated at the beginning, um, some adaptive introgression? Then the question is how much of the asymmetry in hybridization is reality and um, how much it may be an artifact of uh, data and analysis. Question similar whether uh, regarding the prevalence of F2 and back crossings, uh, which um, I would like to confirm with other methods. Mixing of ploides and SNP analysis does not seem to matter, but the question is really how generalizable this is. And finally, parallax don't seem to matter. And um, actually that's uh, something uh, we would like to publish as uh, soon as possible to uh, have something to cite for reviewers who criticize us again for mixing um, different ploides. So what's next to come? There's uh, actually also a GBS analysis of East Ukrainian uh, hotspots. So uh, we are also aiming at the third uh, hotspot of diversity. We are doing hype sack of fresh and old herbarium material. Next year will be exciting. We'll sequence three whole genomes for the group. And uh, we will also do some multiplex shotgun sequencing of uh, type material which uh, then brings us to a lot of good old fashioned taxonomy for 400 names in the group of 30 species. Lots of uh, names likely some kind of hybrids between the species. And um, so we'll have a lot of fun from taxonomy to uh, genome sequencing. And with that, I thank uh, everybody who helped uh, in these projects, especially uh, Janis Höpke and Daniele Buono, whose uh, master thesis, thesis I presented. Gulsar, my postdoc, who has uh, helped quite a lot with the analyses. Eike Maidan Quellost, uh, who is also among the audience, who is uh, my lab manager and helped uh, with the lab work. And my Ukrainian and Russian colleagues, uh, Sergei Mosyakin and Petro Kosechev. And um, with that, I'm happy to answer questions. All right. Well, thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, as usual, feel free to folks should put their questions in the chat box and then you can turn on the audio and video. It always is a little nicer to have that interaction. Personally, I think the next time you do field work, I in the Altai Mountains, that sounds like a very fun place to visit. So <laughs> it is. And uh, actually, I would have loved to do some field work uh, close to the Altai Mountains this year, but um, that was stopped by some. Yeah. That... <laughs> yeah, you know what? I don't know why. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was going to ask a question real quick, uh, I guess, um, while these, these are coming in. So um, 
Yeah, I was intrigued by the the, the paralog result actually that the, didn't seem to, to have a huge impact, but it does seem, so these are auto polyploids. So it does seem that that might, it might be different for an allo if the variation is being confused between the paralogs from the subgenomes um, by an analysis. Yeah, I'm sort of just thinking about that. Uh, yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, especially when I talk with that Gado Ortiz about uh, this result and uh, that uh, did make a nice uh, software, but uh, doesn't seem to matter. You said, oh, what? It's uh, making such a difference in my system. But, uh, <laughs> compared it and uh, actually has uh, uh, done these analyses among Cupidaceae, so among different genera. And uh, so much older divergence. Right. And that's where then you've got potentially unique discrete alleles for different paralogs possibly that aren't shared anymore. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's probably where that, where however fast that evolves is probably where that line is at then. Yeah. That's, that, that's really good to know. It's nice to see this empirically. Uh, I see Paul Bleshak. Paul's got a question. Uh, Paul, yeah. if you want to come online, feel free to ask your question or, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, I just had a quick question. Um, so first, yeah, great talk, by the way. Um, but I just wanted to know if um, the simulations that you did for looking at uh, the effect of either doing co-dominant or dominant genotyping, uh, was that just for autopolyploids? Or did you do allopolyploids as well? Um, that was actually um, autopolyploids, but those <clears throat> autopolyploids would hybridize. So we started okay. with 24, 25, uh, diploids, 25 tetraploids uh, of uh, two species, and those were then able to mix. Okay, uh, but it was still like polysomic inheritance? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Cool. It was a simple uh, simulation, but um, nevertheless, uh, we are grateful to see some difference between our AFLP data, or simulated AFLP data, and uh, the um, simulated IPIRATE data, which could explain differences we saw between uh, the two types of analyses. Yeah, it was definitely a really cool result. So yeah, thanks. Um, triploids, yes. Um, good question. Um, actually, we've done thousands of ploidy estimations in Veronica. And um, so far, the only tri uh, triploid found in nature is in a completely different uh, group of Veronica. And um, for the crossings, we actually managed to get from, how many crossings did uh, Daniela do? Like 20 to 30 crossings, so we managed to get uh, seeds from one uh, inter ploidy uh, crossing and those were only a couple of 10 seeds which uh, we could grow to uh, small plantlets and those were triploid and um, I'm looking uh, forward to see whether they really grow up and um, but triploids are extremely rare in uh, Veronica so um, this uh, seems to be in some kind of barrier. Um, yeah, the next question looks like it's from uh, Justin Conover. Hey, Dirk, thanks for, thanks for a great talk. Um, I may have just miss seen this in your slide, but I think you said that in the, um, <clears throat> when you're looking at the dominant genotyping, that ABBB heterozygotes would be labeled as A under the dominant scheme. Is that right? And that can you explain why that would be? Um, yep. That's is, is that because it's, is that because it's a reference to a diploid or? Because uh, actually the ABBB would be a one zero 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 which uh, then uh, in an AFLP analysis, you would only see the one, the present fragment. You wouldn't see the absent fragment. Gotcha, okay. Okay, so there's just a presence absence. Yep. For, okay, yeah. gotcha. So it was a bit confusing to label them with A and B, I guess. <laughs> okay, no, right. thanks for that clarification. I appreciate it. Sure.
All right. Well, I, I think that's all of the, uh, maybe that's all the questions. So Jonathan wants to do an announcement here. <laughs> Oops, I have to unmute myself <laughs> and uh, you can hear me. Yeah, here I am in real life. Well, we have, I, I have a, a wonderful announcement for another polyploidy seminar. And that is by someone who you all know. Let's see if I can share this. This coming Thursday, our departmental seminar here at Iowa State University is by Mike Barker. And that's what he looks like in the little window on his screen. I was going to put up a mugshot of him, but that's not necessary. Mike, would you please follow this up by sending out another uh, email to the group? All right, I sure can. I can send that yeah, Zoom thanks. link out. And okay. this one isn't half protected, so please don't put this out anywhere on the internet. I don't want us to be Zoom bombed in the middle of my, Mike's talk. That would be bad. It might be entertaining, but let's not do that. Yeah, <laughs> it might be memorable. But welcome to Iowa on Thursday, everybody. Thank Will you. that be recorded, John? Uh, yes, these are recorded. Because it would otherwise would be a late night show for the European. Oh, that's true. That's true. Yeah, they are recorded and we'll find a way to post it with Mike's approval. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> Great. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah, I look forward to it. All right. Uh, any other questions for either uh, uh, Ovidu or, or Dirk today? All right. Well, with that, I'd like to uh, uh, thank everyone. Thank both the uh, both of you for for great talks, and um, uh, I will uh, uh, send around the uh, announcement link for both this and the next for both the, the talk that I'm doing on Thursday, as well as the next Polyblood webinar uh, 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 soon here, as usual, uh, and. Uh, I appreciate uh, everybody uh, coming today and, and hope everyone has a, has a great week. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Mike, for organizing this. This is really a great series.